If Carmine Lubertazzi Sr. didn't have a stroke in two Tonys, what would have changed? <laughs> The reporters on the news were pretty spot on with their predictions, huh? Create a potentially violent power struggle. But first, who is Carmine? You distracted me. I'm taking a mulligan. Boss of the Lupertazzi crime family? Answer the fucking thing. Father? You put your sunblock on? Grandfather? Let's get started. My daughter was coming here with the baby later. Counselor? Be a better friend to yourself. Did I say boss? Don doesn't wear shorts. Let's get back to this hypothetical. Look, I got some bad news. Dad's had a stroke. Let me tell you something. It's like that game we used to play as kids. Crack the whip. You run around like an idiot, holding hands as tight as you can, and then the line snaps. Smell that? What? Bernie here. Somebody let's go. All right, come on. Hold come on. on. Yes, sir. Right. Is he breathing? And you're next. Fuck! Johnny Sack's gonna go to war, Tom. No, he's not. It's not the boat. It's not the boat. It's Lorraine Caluso. Rainy Caluso. And the Joe Peeps thing? Where does that leave us? This isn't the UN, Angelo. What's this, the fucking UN now? How'd it get to this? Retaliation, counterattacks. We're at a fucking stagmire. In terms of who would become the next boss, I actually don't think that little Carmine would have wanted to be the boss to begin with if it weren't for what Johnny did with putting the rosary on Carmine that was related to Opus Dei. Because it was almost like Johnny was marking his territory in a very perverse way. And that's, I think, when things really changed. Traditionally, the spot would go to Carmine's son, little Carmine. But Carmine kind of had his own thing going on in Miami Beach and he certainly wasn't power hungry. Johnny Sack, on the other hand, was more than ready. He'd been Carmine Sr.'s underboss for many years and felt that he was entitled to become the next boss. So much so that he actually wanted to take out Carmine Sr. even before he had a stroke. But there's differences between this and Castellano. Yes, you still got the four other families who could raise a stink. But Andy's my brother in law. I have their ear. You yourself said. I was like another son to him. I was being polite. It was his deathbed. I should have written those words down. Maybe you should have, John, because they don't mean anything anymore. You understand what I'm saying? At a certain point, of course, someone else would have had to take over as Carmine was getting up in age. But presumably, if he hadn't had a stroke, there would have been more time to prepare for an orderly transition. This could get ugly. There's a lot of potential for bloodshed. There were a few scenarios that could have taken shape following Carmine Sr.'s death in Two Tonys. As we know, Johnny Sack later emerges as the boss. But that wasn't necessarily written in the stars ahead of time. Earlier in this video, I did a little quick preview of the domino effect that occurred when one person was killed and then another person was killed out of retaliation for the previous killing, so on and so forth. Let's go through it again. If Carmine had remained in power, Lorraine wouldn't have gotten punished for not kicking up to John. Lady Shylock, you got some reputation. Yeah, my mother said that might happen. For Joey Peeps and Billy Leotardo, if Lorraine doesn't get killed, then presumably Rusty and Angelo wouldn't have tried to hire Tony B to kill Joey Peeps in retaliation, which would then have prevented Phil and Billy from killing Angelo, and in turn, prevent Tony B from trying to kill Phil and successfully killing Billy Leotardo, which we know then leads Tony Soprano to reluctantly have to take out Tony B himself. It was either Tony Soprano kill him or the New York guys find him and torture him before killing him. That's not to say that little Carmine is completely innocent. He certainly does know how to ruffle feathers. One example is the round of golf that Carmine Sr. and little Carmine played with Johnny Sack 
when Carmine came up from Miami Beach to visit. A reflection, John. Maybe that's the sticking post. Tony feels like your friends and not business associates. See? What am I always saying? I hate this fucking shit. Now, if you want to really jump down the rabbit hole, we could think about how things would have been different if Phil, Angelo, and Tony B hadn't all gotten out of the can at the same time and how that kind of all played into the dynamic and the relationships. Something I have more questions about is this whole five families Andy thing. I know the Sopranos exists in a universe where La Cosa Nostra exists, but otherwise the five families are mostly left out of the story. So is it possible that a different plot could have emerged where the other families did play a role, even if it was a small one? What about this Andy, Johnny Sack brother-in-law guy? In the season five finale, when Tony calls Neil Mink as he's running away from Johnny Sack's house, who's just been arrested, Neil tells him that Jimmy Petriel has been cooperating with the feds and that if Carmine were still alive, he also would have been pulled into this indictment. Gambling, homicides, trafficking, 18 fucking years worth. It's a major crap lock, my friend. Honestly, I can't see Johnny Sack just sitting down, getting in line, and waiting his turn. The fact that even after the settlement, he still then approached Tony again about taking out Carmine, I don't think he would have been okay with the status quo. Now, whether or not he would have been successful at taking Carmine out is another matter. We don't know if he would have actually been able to find someone to do it. That wasn't connected to any of the families. Come on, you gotta get your chance soon enough. Tomorrow I go into work. Creeps on this petty pace. And I take orders from him again? I don't know about you, but that does not sound like someone who's okay with things staying the way they are. Let's talk about the butterfly effect. The butterfly effect is the idea that small events can have an unpredictable influence on the future. It's the idea that small things in a complex system may have no effect, a small effect, or a massive effect. So if we think of this for our Sopranos hypothetical here, there's no simple answer. For example, if Carmine doesn't have a stroke in two Tonys, he stays alive and remains in power. Does he fall ill later in the season? Does Johnny Sack try to have him whacked again? Do other disputes and power struggles begin or continue? And does Carmine Sr. get indicted at the end of season five like Johnny Sack? These are just some of the questions among many, many others. For example, Rusty Emilio. We know that he was on little Carmine's side in the power struggle, but what role, if any, would he have played in season five and season six for that matter, if Carmine Sr. had still been alive? What about Jerry Torsiano, Doc Santoro, Albi? Butchie, would these guys have played any different role if Carmine had stayed alive? Let's look at the big picture once more in the opposite direction. What about you? Do you think anything would have changed if Carmine didn't die when he did? Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this latest Sopranos hypothetical. Let me know what you think, and remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Take care.